On average, we breathe between 16 to 18 breaths per minute. So to get the average of an hour, we multiply 18 times 60 minutes and we get 1,080 breaths per hour, which is exactly one half sign of a zodiac cycle of 2,160 years. So we're in the Pisces now, and we're going into Aquarius. You know, the average breath per day is multiplying the average per hour of a 1,080 times 24 hours in a day. Drum roll, please. We get 25,920 breaths each and every day, exactly equal to Plato's great year of 25,920 years of the zodiacal cycle above. As above, so below. Hi, folks. And today we're going to get into a 300-year-plus misconception about how the heart works. You can share this with all your cardiologists, your health practitioners. Let them know that for 100 years they've had the answers, but because Rockefeller medicine technology, Western medicine, will not allow us to know the truth, we have to discover it for ourselves. So let's get into it. Little facts about the heart. Uh, it beats more than 2.5 billion times in your lifetime, over 100,000 times in a day. Pumps a million barrels of blood during an average of lifetime, enough to fill three super tankers. Uh, and this is what we're going to get into here. The heart has its own electrical pulse, impulse, hence it can continue to beat even when separated from the body as long as there is a steady supply of oxygen. It's the hardest working organ of the body. It supplies purified blood to 7.5 trillion cells. And I did not know this, but a woman's heart beats faster than a man's. A man 70 per minute, woman is 78 per minute. And the first anatomy professor described uh, the heart in 1706. The basic understanding of the human heart has changed little in over 300 years. Now new insights into the structure and function of the heart will change forever the way we view it. The current understanding of the heart and its very crucial role and function has evolved over many, many centuries. The reason that we have focused so much on it is the fact that failure of this pump creates major problems in health to patients and in, in the whole health care problem and the finances and the unfortunate mortality of, of heart failure. I think the importance of this uh, theory uh, and these findings in terms of research, uh, treatment, uh, and so on in the future is probably uh, not really known at the present time. It's, it's such a dramatic change from the understanding of the heart's uh, physiology, both electrophysiology and functional physiology. When English physician William Harvey discovered the circulatory system. When Harvey came along in 1628, he, for the first time, really led people to understand very clearly that this was a pump introduced in a circuit that was one continuous uh, circulatory system. And therefore, the lung played a crucial role in oxygenating, but it was all part of one circuit. His prestige as the father of the circulation, unfortunately, transcended into his description of the heart, which was rather incomplete. And he thought this was a homogeneous muscle that, that uh, contracted and pumped and relaxed and just passively uh, was filled. And that concept uh, remained for many years. In fact, Harvey's concept of the heart prevails to this day. That is, a muscle with four chambers that contracts to eject blood and then relaxes to be passively filled by the atria. I believe that this, this concept of the normal anatomy of the heart and how normality is changed by pathology allows us to go back toward normality. And if that is correct, I think that the, the, the information that Dr. Tarank Wasp has given us has allowed us to begin to deal with heart failure in a, in a purely geometric way that restores the natural formation, natural spiral formation. And, and I believe uh, we've been, so far we've been quite correct, and I think we're on track. And I think if we are on track, this information will help us deal with the biggest health hazard in the world, which is congestive heart failure. Clear demonstration of the existence of this myocardial band and how it allows 
the structure of the heart to be configured in such a special way uh, undoubtedly will have a towering importance and would certainly be the equivalent but actually surpassed by far to the establishment of the circulatory system by Harvey. Uh, I say that without denying the historical importance of Harvey, but mostly because there has been a long period in which we did not have gigantic advances in understanding of the heart function, which could translate into major changes of the paradigms of treatment in surgery, as well as in our medical treatment. And I think that this band is really going to fulfill that, in addition to opening a number of important questions that should promote basic research of great significance. Amazingly, a look at the human heart during fetal development reveals the heart starts and looks like a worm at about 20 days of life. At 30 days, it looks like a fish, an amphibian heart at 40 days, and then a human heart at 50 days. In effect, the heart of a human embryo undergoes one billion years of development in the course of 50 days. You see this correlation between a spiral formation in nature, which is common in plants, shells, fish, heaven, all different areas, and the heart seems to be one part of that spiral. And so the design of the ventricle seems to be a natural design. That is, it's no different than many of the other spirals in nature. It's just that we just discovered it. So this is work that was done by uh, some doctors, including uh, Rudolf Steiner, um, back in the 1900s, early turn of the century, 20th century. Uh, in early 1920, Rudolf Steiner of the Goethe in Switzerland pointed out in lectures to medical doctors that the heart was not a pump forcing inert blood to move with pressure, but that the blood was propelled with its own biological momentum, as can be seen in the embryo, and boosts itself with induced momenta from the heart. It also stated that the pressure does not cause the blood to circulate, but is caused by interrupting the circulation. Experimental corroboration of Steiner's concept, concepts in the embryo and adult is herein presented. I'll put this in the show notes. The fact that the heart by itself is incapable of sustaining the circulation of blood was known to physicians of antiquity. The mechanistic, mechanistic concept of the heart as a hydraulic pump prevailed and became firmly established around the middle of the 19th century. The heart, an organ weighing about 300 grams, is alleged to pump some 8,000 liters of blood per day at rest and much more during activity without fatigue. In terms of mechanical work, this represents the lifting of approximately 100 pounds, one mile high. In terms of capillary flow, the heart is performing an even more prodigious task of forcing the blood with a viscosity five times greater than that of water through millions of capillaries with diameters often smaller than the red blood cells themselves. So what they're postulating is each cell, each blood cell, is its own energy device, its own electromagnetic cell. Makes total sense. If the, really, if the heart really does not furnish the blood with total motive force, where is the source of auxiliary force and what is its nature? The answer to these questions will foster a new level of understanding of the phenomena of life and the biological sciences enable physicians to rediscover the human being which all too often may feel they have lost. The Torrent Guasp Myocardial Ventricular Band the heart, unraveled, will change forever the way we view it. Such a simple thing like a rope, like a muscular band twisted like a rope that describes uh, a helicoid in this space, delimitating two cavities, the right ventricular cavity and the left ventricular cavity. This is so simple. In 1864, Pettigrew, a well-known British professor of anatomy, described the spatial organization of the heart fibers as, quote, an arrangement so unusual and perplexing that it has long been considered as forming a kind of Gordian knot in anatomy. I learned about the ventricular band when I visited Barcelona about a year and a half ago, and I went over to talk to some colleagues about a new operation we're doing for heart failure. 
and they suggested that there was something in Barcelona that had dissected the heart out and had some ideas about cardiac anatomy, and I had never heard of uh, Dr. Francisco Torrent Guasp. And he and I met, and the first thing he told me is that my concept of how the heart was formed was not accurate. And then he told me that the heart's way it's, the way it has its conduction that I understood is probably not accurate. And in fact, the heart's a rope. And I think that I heard something like that, and I said, that's really amazing. I, I can't believe it. But uh, he then showed us exactly how the heart was formed and, and had reduced it in its simplest possible category. And I said, that's truly amazing, because he had dissected segments of the heart, and he showed us that his concept of a rope was, was very appropriate. In the early 1950s, as a fourth-year medical student at Salamanca University in Spain, Francisco Torrent Guas began an anatomical study of the heart to prove scientifically that his theory and the early observations of Erasistratus, Galen, and others were indeed correct. Of the complexity of the arrangement, I need not speak further than to say that Vesalius, Albinus, Haller, and de Blainville all confessed their inability to unravel it. Unquote. Torrent Quas believed that the evolved helical human heart still essentially behaved like a worm, in that the wave of contraction starts just beneath the pulmonary artery and follows the band to its end, where the muscle touches the aorta, much like the sequential movement of a worm. Still, Torrent Quas had yet to determine how this worm-like band functioned in order to perform the heart's two critical activities. During 23 years, I have been, I was thinking about this problem. I, I made a lot of hypotheses, but uh, no one was convincing me. Until it arrived one moment, one moment in which I was, I was invited to give a talk in a hospital in Madrid. And uh, I remember that after the, the, the giving the talk, uh, somebody, put a, f a videotape in a TV monitor and I saw the heart, normal human heart, working. And when I saw this, this image, then uh, uh, the light came to my brain and then I realized what was the mechanical trick used by the heart. What Torrent Guasp observed was the base of the heart moving down and the walls thickening during ejection and then the base moving up forcefully, increasing the volume of the heart during diastole. All the while, the apex stays in place, virtually motionless. Uh, Rudolf Steiner pointed out there are several occasions that the blood moves autonomously and that the pressure is not the cause of blood flow, but the result of it. Uh, this concept of blood having its own momentum. And once we saw that, we realized that that we have to now explain it in terms of what we understand about how the heart works. The problem that first uh, arose when looking at uh, Torrent Guasp's uh, concept of the band, uh, the heart being a band, is that uh, it, make, it would make sense that once it's unfolded, uh, as, as he unfolds the heart like this, it's clear that the first part of the heart's here at the pulmonary outflow tract, and then uh, it contracts around the, uh, uh, the apical portion, ventricular septal portion, and then the LV outflow tract. With the most important pieces of the puzzle solved, a model of the structure and mechanics of the torrent guasp myocardial ventricular band could now be constructed. The delivery of electrical impulses through the heart's specialized conduction system results in a wave of contractions that follows the path of the ventricular band from the pulmonary artery to the aorta. Active contraction wanes along the band as the wave progresses. Sequential activation of the model produces four phases of contraction that define narrowing, shortening, lengthening, and widening of the ventricles. Charismatic, empowered, domineering. All the eights feel empowered and emboldened by the meaning of their suit. The heart suit symbolizes our social and emotional needs. Thus, the eight of hearts seeks power and control in the matters of the heart. The artery serves as a subsidiary mimical heart function by providing spiraling boost 
to the circulating blood. In doing so, the arteries dilate to receive the incoming blood and contract to deliver an impulse to increase the blood's momentum. The spiral formation of the apical loop produces a twisting effect, causing a counterclockwise rotation of the heart, including the apex, which remains in a fixed position. The shortening and twisting of the apical loop squeezes the ventricular cavity to raise pressure and opens the aortic valve to eject blood to the body. The helical course of the contraction continues with a vortex or figure eight around the apex. Contraction of the ascendant segment twists its fibers, resulting in a clockwise rotation of the heart. This clockwise twist of the apical loop produces a potential vacuum and begins to lengthen the ventricle, pushing the basal loop back up. The untwisting opens the AV valve so that atrial blood is actively sucked into the ventricle. This causes widening of the cavity as 50 to 60 percent of effective filling occurs as the ascending apical segment rises. Further widening occurs during relaxation of the entire muscular band. Full diastolic size follows atrial filling just before the next contraction begins. We've been taught in the past that the heart constricted and dilated, and we learned that from William Harvey, and it turns out that the spiral formation of the heart makes the heart twist and untwist. And when it twists and untwists, the twisting is for ejection, and the untwisting is for emptying. So once you understand that formation, you begin to understand what you see on, a, on an example of how the heart works. And in general, we have in the past looked at the cavity of the heart, but not the walls. We have in the past looked at the cavity of the heart, but not the walls. Using a unique imaging technique to examine the architecture of the heart, a cow heart is first inflated with compressed air. Then, in a series of X-ray images looking down on the heart, the helical structure of the muscular band is clearly revealed as we move down into the apex of the left ventricle. Once again, notice how the loops of the band turn in opposition. Two reciprocal spirals merging at the apex. The spiraling helical structure of the ventricular band is a pattern found throughout nature. You can see it in the patterns of seashells, in the growing flower buds of a daisy. A ram's horn gets its strength from the spirals within spirals of its architecture. The spiral is a common formation at every scale of nature, from the DNA molecule to global weather systems, all the way up to the stars. Again, observe the wave of contraction as it moves across the band, just as Torrent Guasp had theorized. Many call it the cardiac dance, the twisting, pulsing rhythms of the human heart in motion. Now, for the first time in history, it can be understood as the sequential movement of the muscular band, starting just below the pulmonary artery and ending where the band touches the aorta. The heart really is a tube, and, and the heart actually remains like a worm in a sense. That is, the impulse has to go from one point to the other. So if you start with the pulmonary artery on one side, and you go through this longitudinal tube that Dr. Tarant Guasp has shown us, you have to come out with the aorta on the other side. And with the magnetic resonance imaging, we began to look at the walls. And suddenly you understand that the heart has an apex which stays still. And the way it works is that it it twists and thickens and untwists and lengthens. And so our concept of the heart filling and emptying by constriction and dilatation as a transverse factor doesn't, doesn't really occur in the heart. What I always learned in the past was that the heart filled from the atrium to the ventricle by the pressure that, that was different between the atrium and the ventricle. And this was taught to me over about 350 years because this is what William Harvey, who designed the circulation, taught us. And well, if you look at the MRI, you see two things that are quite fascinating. First, you see it constrict and shorten and thicken to eject. And then you see it change its orientation and untwist. 
and it lengthens, and the cavity of the heart changes its size before the valves open. And because of that change in the size of the cavity compared to the blood within it, that is, the blood's the same, you create suction. And with the suction, you can watch the blood on the MRI get sucked into the ventricle, and you can see that 90% of filling occurs during that initial phase, even though the pressure difference is tiny. It's not a pressure phenomenon, it's a suction phenomenon. So with understanding the, the nature of how the loops twist and untwist, you understand two things. The first thing you understand is how the heart ejects and fills by suction. And the second you thing you realize, if that anatomy is changed, as we can also see in MRI, where the ventricle becomes spherical, the capacity to twist and, su and, and eject and untwist and suck is lost. So the patient at heart failure can't twist very well, and therefore he can't increase his output of his heart to be able to work, and he gets tired frequently. And more importantly, it can't untwist to suck the blood back. And if it doesn't untwist to take the blood back, it only can fill by pressure, and that's exactly what Harvey said it did. But it only does that when it fails as a predominant mechanism. And when it fills by pressure, the pressure in the heart increases, the pressure in the lungs increase, and the patient has pulmonary congestion or his lungs get full of fluid and he can't breathe. And, and the, the symptoms are related to the inability of the heart to do its standard twisting and untwisting, which the spirals allow us to see. So this is work that was done by uh, some doctors, including uh, Rudolf Steiner, um, back in the 1900s, early turn of the century, 20th century. Uh, in early 1920, Rudolf Steiner of the Gertum in Switzerland pointed out in lectures to medical doctors that the heart was not a pump forcing inert blood to move with pressure, but that the blood was propelled with its own biological momentum, as can be seen in the embryo, and boosts itself with induced momenta from the heart. It also stated that the pressure does not cause the blood to circulate, but is caused by interrupting the circulation. Experimental corroboration of Steiner's concept, concepts in the embryo and adult is herein presented. I'll put this in the show notes. The fact that the heart by itself is incapable of sustaining the circulation of blood was known to physicians of antiquity. The mechanistic mechanistic concept of the heart as a hydraulic pump prevailed and became firmly established around the middle of the 19th century. The heart, an organ weighing about 300 grams, is alleged to pump some 8,000 liters of blood per day at rest and much more during activity without fatigue. In terms of mechanical work, this represents the lifting of approximately 100 pounds one mile high. In terms of capillary flow, the heart is performing an even more prodigious task of forcing the blood with a viscosity five times greater than that of water through millions of capillaries with diameters often smaller than the red blood cells themselves. So what they're postulating is each cell, each blood cell, is its own energy device, its own electromagnetic cell. Makes total sense. If the, really, if the heart really does not furnish the blood with total motive force, where is the source of auxiliary force and what is its nature? The answer to these questions will foster a new level of understanding of the phenomena of life and the biological sciences enable physicians to rediscover the human being which all too often may feel they have lost. And if you begin to look at spirals, if you look at a spiral simply and pick the middle of the spiral up, you'd form a helix. And of course, the heart is a helix. The electrical impulse of the heart originates from specialized cells called the sinus node, located on the right atrium. The impulse spreads across the atria and causes them to contract. A conduction block between the atria and ventricles prevents the impulse from traveling directly across to the ventricles, except for one place in the AV node, located at the center of the heart. After a short delay, there is an explosion of electrical activity from the AV node down a specialized conduction system that saturates the inside of the ventricles with electrical activity. From that point on, the electrical activity goes from the inside of the heart to the outside of the heart by propagating through muscle cells. Examining electrophysiological and functional data, Dr. Cox and his group calculated the delivery of the impulse throughout the ventricular band. So if you very carefully plot out how the electrical impulse is delivered to the, to the heart muscle by the specialized conduction system, 
and correlate that with the velocity of conduction in thin and thick areas of the heart, then it, then it comes out it, it, to precisely mimic the sequence of activation, uh, just as uh, you might have predicted or you might have hoped. Uh, and, you know, it, it has to be that way. I mean, we didn't make it that way. Uh, it, it, was, it, it has developed that way. And all we have to do is figure it out, and we just hadn't figured it out earlier. Um, a major misconception is that it, it flows in a laminar fashion, whereas in reality the main patterns appear to be a vortex. This leads to a whole new concept of circulatory dynamics, which one which goes a long ways towards explaining the close interaction between the heart and the blood, both of which are derived from the same embryonic material. Two of the main embryological observations have been that the blood starts circulating before the heart has been fully formed and that it circulates in a spiraling fashion, as in the single-stage tube heart of the chick before the valves have developed. So Victor Schauberger, one of my favorite unsung heroes, and should be yours too once you learn about this incredible man, right up there with Nikola Tesla. Interesting, uh, Austria, they came out of as well and they lived around the same time frame. Um, Schauberger is a well-read but formerly uneducated man who lived with a great propor greater pro proportion of his life observing and learning from nature. His insights and applications are so beautiful in their simplicity and in their applications so harmonious with nature that his work and his ideas de deserve far greater recognition. And I want to tie this into the troidal heart field, how his implosion vortex is uh, very, very similar, if not exact, to the same principles of how we're describing how the heart works today as a, uh, a pulsing mechanism, not a pump. So this is where we get into the helix spiral, helical spiral heart. Uh, nature frequently uses hyperbolic spiral, which is extremely centri centripetal and internally moves towards the center, which spirally, spirally movements are found in the spiral nebula of galaxies and space in the natural flow of water, blood, and sap. While the centrifugal force used by current technology occurs in nature and in its, in its destructive aspects, on occasions for dissolving energy, pushing the medium from the center outwards towards the periphery and straight lines. The particles of the medium being first weakened and dissolved and broken up. Broken up. Nature uses this action to disintegrate complexes which have lost their vitality or have died. That's the explosion. In nature, there is a continual switch from one movement to the other, alternating currency. But if the development is to occur, then the movement of the gross must be predominant. Victor inv investigated a new motor fuel that could be used in ordinary combustion engines, but without the dangerous waste products. Water as a constructive hyperbolic motion was the ability to bring about the synthesis of hydrocarbons suitable for fuel. Water sprayed into a cylinder and a quantity of natural oxygen is added. A light heat pressure is created by a descending piston is sufficient to transform the highly potent water to gas. This is taking small amounts of force and creating big amounts of energy. Implosion, just like a tornado. He turned his attention again to the trout's ability to jump the mountain streams by harnessing energy from the water. He concluded that the water passing through the trout's gills created a hyperbolic centri centripetal spiral movement. This combined with the trace elements within the gills and changed the passing water into a juvenile water, which by its new characteristic reacted with the surrounding stream water, creating a secondary system of water circulation around the trout's bodies by regulating the pressure within the gills. This is the same thing we saw when they're showing the MRI of the heart beating where the outside did not react, but the inside was pulsing. Here, a cow heart will be dissected. All mammals and birds were found to have a similar heart structure. All mammals and birds were found to have a similar heart structure. The ventricular band, as described by Torrent Guasp, is divided into two loops by a fold at its center. The basal or outer loop and the apical loop, which forms the apex of the heart. The septum of the heart is formed by the crossing of the descendant and ascendant segments, which we observed in the dissection. The two apical segments loop in a helical fashion, forming the apex of the heart, which reveals itself to belong to the left ventricle. When I looked at the heart the first time, I saw a circumferential basal loop, and then I saw a descending limb and an ascending limb, and they curled around each other, had a helix, 
and had a vortex at the tip of the ventricle. And the angles at which they go is about 60 degrees, 60 degrees going down and 60 degrees going up, and they cross each other in that way. And for years, people had wondered why that happened in the septum, why the heart looked that way. And I realized this was really a, a spiral, and I began to think about spirals, and I began to understand that uh, the spirals are almost the, uh, the master plan of nature in terms of structure and in terms of rhythm. With the discovery of the ventricular band, Torrent Wasp had only solved one piece of the puzzle. How the band worked came next. All right, so implicit in nature, there's four major concepts. Blood is naturally inert and therefore must be forced to circulate. There is a random mix of form particles in the blood. The cells in the blood are under pressure at all times. The blood is amphorous and is forced to fill its vessels and thereby takes on their form. The blood's had its own form, the vortex, which determines rather than conforms to the shape of the vascular lumen and circulates in the embryo with its own inherent biological momentum before the heart begins to function. It is not subject to pulse restricting pressure implied in the pressure propulsion concept. The blood is not propelled by pressure, but by its own biological momenta boosted by the heart. In, in studying uh, and comparing the, the structure and the, and the shape of healthy and sick hearts, we became aware of the fact that the sick heart represented a Romanesque structure. And in fact, uh, if we look at some structures that are typically Romanesque, such as the magnificent aqueduct of Segovia, which has stood since the year 10 uh, AD, uh, they cannot allow height or major width, uh, which was provided rather brilliantly by the Gothic arch and the Gothic cathedral. And we see in Notre Dame, for instance, that remarkable, huge structure uh, with beautiful vaulted ceilings, which is sustained to this day by the very ingenious fact that all the vectors of force in that type of arch are transmitted outwardly so that you can put external supports in the way of flying buttresses that maintain a remarkably high and majestic structure. The very interesting thing is that the heart, the Gothic heart, then actually represents and can be understood very well by looking at Dr. Tarrant Grasp's normal heart model in the band. If we look at it, we see the very interesting image that in fact we have this Gothic structure supported on the outside by the basal loop. And that Gothic structure of fibers that spiral from out, outward to the inward portion provides the remarkable resilience and strength of that wall, as well as the ability to twist and squeeze out blood with extraordinary force and velocity, which are in fact the hallmarks of a healthy heart. When the heart becomes sick, however, the Gothic structure becomes Romanesque or rounded and loses its power to pump efficiently. The vectors of force no longer focus on the buttress, the basal loop, but balloon outward. The fiber orientation where the apical loop crosses changes from 60 degrees to something more horizontal, decreasing the heart's ability to twist and untwist effectively. As we look at the heart, as I understood it, the heart twists and it thickens. And this is a normal heart and it has an apex. And that apex is the normal function of the heart. It twists and thickens. In heart failure, it becomes a sphere, like a basketball. And it doesn't work well as a basketball. It can't do its normal activities. And so in a sense, a normal heart looks like a football. And you can, of course, throw a spiral pass. You can get to the receiver. And the abnormal heart looks like a basketball. It, it's circular. And in a sense, uh, a high school quarterback can throw a pass 50 yards very well. And in fact, better than Magic Johnson can throw a basketball. Because the problem isn't the player. It's the, it's the ball you're dealing with. 
And so you deal with heart failure. Our purpose in heart failure is to simply make the basketball into a football. Several conditions result in a dilated heart. In surgical procedures now being performed by Dr. Buckberg and others, the left ventricle of a dilated heart is restored to its natural elliptical shape. Though different techniques are used, the goal for each is to bring the heart back to nature and restore the fiber orientation, the 60 degree angles, so the heart is capable of pumping and sucking more efficiently. These procedures provide a surgical solution that makes the spherical heart more elliptical and restores the helical heart formation. So what the good doctors haven't quite connected yet is the heart is a toroidal field and it's electromagnetism. It's the pulsing is caused by the electromagnetism of the plasma field that makes the uh, blood each individual cell as its own pump. And that's what they're not connecting to yet, which Steiner's work has proven. So the heart is more powerful than the brain. The heart is up to 100,000 times stronger electrically, 5,000 times stronger magnetically than the brain. So if we go over here to the uh, toroidal field definition, all right, and this is tor tor the torus in science. Um, implicit definition is a toroidal space is the name used to describe the area and volume of a torus or so-called donut shape. This special form has been used to describe or represent a number of things in the real, actual material world, as well as imag imaginary potential. So they use it as an excuse to describe the black hole, which is heliocentric nonsense. Um, okay, and also toroidal shape has discovered the most efficient way to wind an electrical transformer as a coil wound in this configuration produces very clean, highly accurate, precise, and reliable power. Thank you, Nikola Tesla. The torus has also been used to illustrate certain concepts of subtle energies. The form figures heavily into the esoteric of sacred geometry, and meta-science that reveals how shape and form are primary underlying principles of our manifestation, our creation. The seers have confirmed that the human aura appears in a series of nested spherical torus forms. Ancient seers went out of body and reported their observations, calling it the world tree after their sighting of the main central axis. We will show this concept reappears in remarkably similar fashion across a huge number of different cultures and a clear connection to the nested spherical torus can easily be established literally one in the same formation and here you see it from a uh, tonka from um, uh, tibet and here's the toroidal field and you can see the heart the ventricular and you'll see this also in the flat earth which i'll get into at the end here so the tube torus you see this this flower of life uh, using simple compass create the flower of life seven basic steps to the composition yields the study of the vortex through the flower of life. This is the vortex in the center. One of the energy patterns around the body is a torus or donut uh, looping around to connect at the feet and the head. It's though we're in the middle position of the donut. The flow in through the head and feet is bidirectional. In other words, it flows like the tides one way and then the next. In the matrix of this flow are the wave and particle principle, uh, particle relationships that structure and govern the nurturing cosmic energy from which we are crystallized. So again, look at the saying, it's, this is the center right here, the vortex. All right, let's take a look at that. Electromagnetism is what the world and the universe is made of. Positive and negative energies, electricity like the sun, magnetism like the moon, positive and negative energies. The earth has a north pole, anoid, and the arctic circle, or if you want to say south pole, is the opposite and the sea salt of the ocean provide the salinity provides the electrical ionization electric electrical charge all right so what do we do in a heart if somebody's dying in their heart we use a defibrillator we shock the system with electrical power and here's an implantable cardioverter defibrillator it keeps the pulse it's an electrical unit the heart is electromagnetic Electric power is everywhere, present in unlimited quantities, and can drive the world's machinery without need of coal, coal, oil, gas, batteries, or the common fuels. 1905, folks, we've had free energy, and here's the Tesla coil, toroidal field. You see it in action here. It's over a century known. Same as our bodies, folks, the toroidal field. Here it is again, our heart, the biggest frequency creator. 
So that's why we got to lead with our hearts. Here's the vortex. Here's how the vortex works. What does that look like in the middle? It looks like a tornado. So here's how the vortex works. It pumps it up, around, and up and around. And on a flat earth model, this is how you see the sun go up and the sun go down and the moon go up and the moon go higher and the moon go lower. Some question the relative height as it circles around. Well, here's your answer right here. It's all in a vortex in a plasma field. Look at that. Same stuff. Look at how the energy is concentrated. This was what Victor Schauberger was proving back in the 40s and 50s before they had him killed off when he wouldn't work for NASA. It's concentrated energy. This is how the heart pumps. It's a valve. It gets bigger and it gets smaller. So tell all the cardio surgeons this is how it works. Tell all the doctors. Tell all the health practitioners. You can save cardio disease, folks, with this knowledge. So our body is magnetic energy. Each cell. Each cell. And this is what the uh, Steiner's work, Rudolf Steiner's work, was saying. Each cell is its own pump. And here's our chakras. We're energy beings, folks. We're spiritual beings having a physical experience in a sack of body and blood. Look at each of our eyelids, our shoulders, our stomachs. Each has a different resonating frequency. But look at the heart. It's the biggest by far. The brain waves. These are hertz. And then we also have waves of auras. Our causal body, celestial body, etheric body, astral body, mental body, emotional body. These are all energy fields, folks. And just to wrap this part up, Rubber Soul, the Beatles album came out, is when the Tavistock Institute and Theodore Adorno, working, writing all the music for the Beatles, created the book, uh, creating the album Rubber Soul to celebrate them getting everybody into sneakers, wearing rubber shoes, flip-flops with rubbers, and basically disconnecting us from Earth's consciousness, from Earth's toroidal field, from the heavens above to Earth below. Earth has its own magnetic frequencies, and by wearing rubber, we're disconnected. So get your sole shoes out, get back to leather shoes, get back to bare feet, get back to grounding. Uh, I'll include show notes and a piece of that that I did a, a write-up in my uh, Taboo blog.